Hi, everybody, and a warm welcome to this CubiTech webinar. My name is Anna Stahl, and I'm a clinical psychologist and a clinical advisor at CubiTech, and I will also be your host during today's event. We have a very interesting uh, lecture ahead of us with Professor Sandra Koi, and we will also have a follow-up uh, follow Q&A session on a very hot topic, which I know a lot of you have had interest for. Uh, to my knowledge, we have a lot of clinicians joining us today from several countries in Europe. Uh, so to just mention a few, we have participants from the Nordic countries, from Estonia, uh, England, and of course, the Netherlands. So a warm welcome to all of our viewers joining us today. Before I introduce the two people I have with me today, I'd just like to take the opportunity to encourage all of our viewers to send in any questions you might have during today's webinar. It can be questions directly on Sandra's presentation, but you're also welcome to ask questions on QBTAST, as I know a few of you are new to QBTAST. You are able to ask questions in the comments field on the side or below on your screen. And I also know that we have had questions uh, sent in uh, via email prior to today's event. So we hope to be able to answer as many questions as possible. So with that being said, I'd now like to introduce the two people I have with me joining us today. So first, I'd like to introduce Mikkel Hansen. Mikkel, you are a medical doctor and also the new medical director at QBTAC. And prior joining QBTech, you have a quite extensive uh, background in clinical research and medical devices. And you will be joining us today during our Q&A session and help any questions that might come up. Then I'd like to introduce today's main speaker, who we are very, very honored to have joining us. And that is Professor Sandra Coy. Uh, you are one of Europe's most highly respected researcher and you have done a lot of pioneering work in the field of ADHD. So just to mention a few things, you are a psychiatrist and the founder of PsyQ in the Netherlands. You are also the head of um, the head of the Dutch Expertise Center for Adult ADHD as well as the founder of, of the DIVA. So you have done a lot of things during your career. And with that introduction and background, I once again would like to wish all our viewers welcome. And I'd be happy to hand over to you, Sandra, for, for your presentation. Thanks a lot, Anna. It's my pleasure to present here for you today uh, some of the new knowledge we have on ADC women and uh, on hormonal mood fluctuations that also seem to increase ADHD severity during the menstrual cycle and other um, episodes of hormonal changes. Um, thank you for this invitation. I have one thing to tell you that I did not found PsyQ. <laughs> I founded the adult ADHD department in PsyQ and this is a department with 18 locations in the country. But PsyQ has many more uh, departments and specialisms. I'm also a professor of adult ADHD at Amsterdam University Medical Center in Amsterdam. Okay, I first have a poll uh, in order to get to know each other a bit and I'd like you to fill in to which of those groups uh, you will belong so that we have an idea of uh, who you are that and who you what you might be interested in. So will you please enter um, your, uh, your category in the chat or in the poll, sorry. You can do it now. I was told that 450 people have registered for this meeting and uh, maybe we cannot wait for all people to fill in uh, what category they belong to, but at least a few. So I will continue now with um, the next slide and we will get the results as soon as they are, they are there. Okay, here we go. So the majority is other. 
and 35% psychologists, psychiatrists, physicians, 17%, experience expert, 8.3, and nurse specialists, uh, oh no, the psychiatrist is 8.3, and the nurse specialist is 17%. So we're still curious about the other group, but uh, for now I leave it here and we continue. Thank you. Yes, let's start. Um, what's the difference in, AD, in ADHD between men and women, between boys and girls? Well, to start with, ADHD started as a, as a boyish, boy, boy's disorder. And still people and GPs and professionals think that ADHD is not prevalent in girls or women. So they are less well recognized. This is because boys were studied because of their more hyperactive and maybe aggressive behavior that was annoying to the environment. And when you're annoying to the environment, you may get help earlier than when you are a dreamy, less disturbing person like a girl with ADHD, ADD. So girls were understudied, probably less hyperactive, more inattentive and disorganized. And hyperactivity also may present differently in girls as they may present as spontaneous, talkative girls, enthusiastic, and, and always busy, but this is socially more acceptable than being aggressive, what boys may, may show. So boys got from the beginning more clinical diagnosis than girls, but in adulthood somehow this changes. So in epidemiological studies, uh, women and men are more equal in the prevalence rates in the population. And this, as ADHD we all know, starts in childhood per definition the girls must have been missed earlier. And uh, this is due to several factors. One of them is that girls and women have two times more often ADHD of the inattentive type than men. So when you are dreamy and uh, forgetful and chaotic uh, you're, and you're tired, you won't easily get a, a GP think of ADD or ADHD. Uh, because it's, it's not the, the clinical picture that they're used to in boys. But it's also important to understand that, that although women and girls have two times more often the ADD subtype, the majority still has the combined type, same as, as, as men. Well, the problem for girls and women is, especially women, that they have responsibility not only for themselves, but for the whole family, the household, the agendas, the parties of everybody, the presents, their job. And uh, having difficulty organizing everything, being on time, it is a job from hell. They often told me, and I believe them, because when you're always late and forget stuff, and this, this is multiplying because of all the things you have to do for other people in your family, it's really stressful to have ADHD as a woman. So chaos and tiredness is their daily bread. And the result is that they always feel guilty about things they miss, things they forgot. They have low self-esteem and they are uncertain about their capabilities that they obviously also have. So women with ADD or ADHD are also called queens of distraction. And I'll show you here some of their complaints. Um, they may be chaotic, distracted, easily overwhelmed, unmotivated or lazy, depressed, panicking, have a low, have a low self-esteem. They're tired all the, all the time. They have mood swings. They have no overview and they have premenstrual dysphoric disorder. So it's not so funny to have all this stuff. Um, well, there, I'm not the only one talking about hormonal mood changes. Uh, Sari Solden here to the right already mentioned it a long time ago and also other people. Um, so there's the difference between men and women is obviously hormones and, and cycles and changing levels of hormones. And this is one of the reasons that women were never studied because hormones are annoying in research because you have never a stable uh, trait in women as hormones influence mood and, and cognition and memory. Uh, so it's difficult to measure any symptom level in women as it changes all the time. So this is also one of the reasons that men are more studied than women which is a shame, of course, because now we know nothing about women and we don't know how to deal with those hormonal changes. 
Okay, I told you about the causes of underdiagnosis. It's one of them is the more frequent ADD subtype in women. But another one is that the GP doesn't know about women with ADHD or girls. And he just doesn't recognize uh, the symptoms in girls and he doesn't refer for a clinical diagnosis or treatment. The third reason is that women have a different comorbidity pattern. They have more anxiety, depression, and here we go again, the premenstrual dysphoric disorder, which is also a mood issue. Um, and men have more aggression and uh, um, substance abuse and may also be depressed by the way, but this is more the clinical picture. So it looks, it looks more like internalizing symptoms, as we call it, versus men have more externalizing symptoms. Another difficulty is that women with ADHD can compensate, of course, and they can compensate when they, are, they have a high IQ, they have a lot of external structure. And what many of them do is having a perfectionistic coping style. It means that they have to work until midnight or after midnight to do their homework at school or to, do, to, to finish tasks for work that others have finished at 6 p.m. Uh, and they can relax the whole evening, but they have to work much harder in order achieve, to achieve the same, uh, the chain, the same um, level. So when you are working so hard to reach your, uh, to do what you, what's asked from you, you may get burnout. And this is something we often see in women with ADHD. So this is how rooms can look workplaces or rooms where nobody is allowed to enter because of the mess people feel ashamed and they have no overview where to even start to begin to clean and clear up such a mess i assume it's the same in their head so there's no overview there's a lot of clutter and there is a lot to be done and you start and you start and you start everything at, at the time you never finish anything all right um how to diagnose adhd in women in girls but also in men of course the assessment is similar we use uh, this method we check lifetime symptoms and impairment with an onset of three or more ADHD symptoms before age 12 this is according to the dsm-5 criteria you need five of nine current symptoms of either inattention and or hyperactivity impulsivity or both you use collateral information from spouse or parents when available and the, the interview we developed is the DIVA 5. It's now available in 21 languages, even Russian. Uh, we're very proud that we were able to develop it and to offer it to the world, to people, uh, to clinicians in the world that want to uh, make a careful diagnosis of ADHD. There's now a young DIVA 5 for children uh, and adolescents, also for girls. And you may want to use the QB test or QB check, which is a, a product that's developed by QB Tech that is organizing this meeting. And I'll, I'll talk you through it, how we use it. QB Tech is a Swedish um, organization. They have developed a computer-based task with high resolution motion tracker system. You see it here. So every movement that the person doing the test is uh, making is registered and it's, it's used as a, mo as a measure for hyperactivity. It's available in 10 languages for children and adults, and people who use the, the test are trained by QB Tech uh, on location in order to interpret the, the results and to uh, give them back to the patients. Here's the motion tracker. Here is the uh, infrared. Here is the, well, I forgot the word. And here's the clicker. Uh, for um, making the answers to the uh, task. And the task is, um, is this one for adults. You see those blue and red uh, squares and, and ovals. And you have to click uh, when the next object is the same color and shape as the previous one. So this one is not identical, and but this one is, and this one is as well, but this one is different again. So you have to pay attention for 20 minutes, which is annoying it's you get very tired uh, i did it myself but patients really hate it <laughs> because for them it's much more difficult not to be distracted and to uh, really focus on a, a task that's rather boring that's on purpose of course because we want to measure in 20 minutes 
how the uh, distractedness compares to norm groups of the same gender and age. This is an example of the results. This is the first five minutes, 10, 15, 20 minutes. And here you see a slight increase in the hyperactivity uh, measured. Um, yeah. Here you see the attention and um, impulsivity outcomes. Here the green answers are the right ones. The red um, are the mistakes. And here are the omissions, the missed answers, those little um, stripes. Anyway, you see that this is deviant because we shouldn't have as many mistakes. We shouldn't have so many missed answers. And what we'd like to see in a person without ADHD is that the reaction time variability is, uh, uh, is less, is lower. Um, well, the results are expressed in, in this picture, but also in um, a standard deviation from the norm. This is the norm. The zero is uh, the norm for people of the same age and gender. And this person is functioning around 1.5 standard deviation to the right. And this is the percentile showing that the uh, that this one is really hyperactive. 90th, the 90th percentile is reached by this person during this test. And similar uh, results you get for inattention and impulsivity. You can use the test uh, as an uh, additional uh, um, and as an addition for the diagnostic assessment, but you can also use the test very well for comparing uh, baseline performance and performance after use of ADHD medication. For instance, here we have uh, test one in red baseline and test two in yellow um, after medication. And in this case, it's 10 milligrams of methylphenidate. And here you see that the, the figure is, um, is going to the left. So there is less hyperactivity and the same is true for inattention and impulsivity. And here you see the visual uh, of the results and here you see percentiles dropping. So you can also interpret this result as um, that people have may have effect on hyperactivity, but not so much of, on inattention. And so you you are able to to uh, evaluate effect on the sub the, the domains of ADHD, not only the whole uh, complex of the disorder. Back to the girls. Well, I told you the girls are not as much hyperactive and disruptive, uh, but they are inattentive and it takes a lot of effort to comply to all the tasks a woman has. So they're exhausted. And this leads to chronic tiredness. Chronic tiredness is something important to look for when you suspect a woman may have ADHD. And the question here is, is there indeed a relationship between ADHD and chronic fatigue syndrome? Well, there is. Um, people, girls and women with ADHD are referred to a pediatrician or neurologist for being tired or sleepy. And they diagnose this chronic fatigue syndrome four times as often in girls. And in women with ADHD, in research has shown, they often have this past diagnosis of chronic fatigue. So the question is, are they diagnosed with chronic fatigue, which is in fact a description of a symptom, not a diagnosis in my opinion. And are they lost and don't, are they not recognized? And are they treated for the comorbidity like anxiety and depression, but the ADHD is never considered and missed? Same is true for fibromyalgia, a disorder of chronic pain, fatigue, cognitive impairment. In a study, 44% had also ADHD symptoms. So this is for your orientation where you may find undiagnosed female ADHD. There's a lot of uh, books for women and girls on ADHD, how to deal with it, how to work with it. Um, and another aspect I want to share <clears throat> is that uh, ADHD is not only associated with psychological difficulties like uh, depression and uh, anxiety, but also with a lot of somatic disorders. This is a long list, but they are often more frequent in women, eh? like anxiety, depression, insomnia, chronic pain, obesity, smoking, immune disorders, migraine, especially premenstrual, teenage pregnancies, sexually transmitted disease as a result, low, low libido, 
maybe due to lack of focus, gender identity problems, and polycystic ovarian syndrome is also increased in ADHD. We're only starting to understand how and why all these disorders and diseases come together in ADHD people. And often people ask me about uh, medication for ADHD during pregnancy. Is it allowed? Is it possible? Is it, is it dangerous or is it just a good idea? Well, ADHD medication was never studied because ADHD in women didn't, uh, didn't exist. Now that there is a lot of recognition and exposure to stimulants in the during pregnancy, we know a little bit more, but not enough to be sure about everything. But we, we are at this level that we know that stopping the medication may be also risky because women with ADHD that had, for instance, substance abuse before the, uh, the diagnosis and the treatment may have a relapse in, in substance abuse when you stop the medication in pregnancy or the relationship difficulties may increase again, thereby uh, putting a lot of pressure on the relationship during pregnancy, which is also uh, a, a not a good outcome. So this is always an individual decision with the physician and, and, uh, and the partners uh, whether or not to continue medication. And if you do, uh, what, what, what is there to expect? Well, based on the literature, there is no increase in congenital malformations, but using mesophenidate in pregnancy is associated with a slight increase in cardiac malformations. Miscarriage itself is slightly increased in ADHD and also while using mesophenidate or atomoxygene. So the conclusion for now is that if you need to use stimulants, dexamphetamine may be better than mesophenidate in pregnancy. And here are the references. <clears throat> now, the hormonal mood changes. What we see here is the menstruation, menstrual cycle starting at day one with the menstruation. And here we have uh, the endometrium going down uh, leading to blood loss and then building up again until ovulation and then uh, building up until the next menstruation in four weeks. Here we see the hormones, estrogen peaking during ovulation, dipping and one another peak and then going really down um, before in the last week before menstruation. That's important to remember when I talk you through it because I've, I've more than 25 years of clinical experience with girls and women with ADHD, and they reported severe premenstrual mood instability and increased ADHD severity. And I thought in the end, I, sh I should study it, whether it's really more frequent and whether it's really more severe. And they complain of uh, an increased inability to focus, increased impulsivity, irritability, depression, suicidal thought, panic attacks, anxiety, sleep disturbance, and the efficacy of the medication for ADC seems reduced. And uh, women say it's danger week. You should stay out of my, uh, <laughs> you should stay away because otherwise I might become really aggressive and a conflict, making conflicts with everyone. So here you may see an example of the, uh, the mood swings. Um, there, but when you look into the literature, there was no data so far. So my research question first was to start with, are hormonal mood problems indeed more severe and more frequent? And to compare, we know that the PMDD, the real depression in the week before menstruation is between three and 28% in the population. We did a first study at an ADHD woman conference in 2016, using a self-report questionnaire on mood changes uh, to the level of clinical depression in the three phases of women's lives that the hormonal changes are most prominent. This is the menstrual cycle, the postnatal period, and the perimenopausal period. We use these validated skills, put them together, and uh, made them ready for self-report. So this is the ADHD Womb Conference, the audience, and we asked all of them to fill in the questionnaire before leaving. Uh, the conference. And we also asked them, what should we do? What should we study for you? What is your most urgent question to science? And they said, hormonal mood changes during the life cycle. So this is uh, something that we really took serious and started researching. 
Um, the results of this first questionnaire were that the ADHD women that were at the conference had much higher symptoms of PMDD, post postpartum depression and perimenopausal symptoms. So there was an indication that it was true and that we should study further. So we replicated this questionnaire study in our clinic in women with a diagnosis of ADHD. So these were really assessed women, uh, 209. We use the same questionnaires. And these are the results that's recently published. Uh, among the 209 women with a diagnosis of ADHD, we found 45% of premenstrual dysphoric disorder versus max of 29% in the general population. We also found not only an increased prevalence, but also increased severity. And they used more contraceptives, which is helpful for premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Uh, if you at least continue the contraceptives in the fourth week, of course, otherwise you increase estrogen, uh, lower estrogen levels again. Postpartum depression, there were 85 women with children and they ha had a high rate of postpartum depression after the first child in this case, 58 versus 19% in the general population. And we compared these numbers with uh, studies using the same questionnaires as we used. The climacteric mood symptoms, there were 37 perimenopausal women and they had a threefold increased level of symptoms of anxiety, depression and somatic complaints. So this shows that there is indeed something to study. We published this in Dorani 2020, last year. And um, here you see as an illustration, estrogen during the life phase from uh, 20 to 60, you see it's very high in young women and it goes down after 50 to an extremely low level. And that this level after, men after menopause is around here is really uh, much lower than in younger women. So the question is, how can we treat ADHD women better, taking into account these mood changes during the um, uh, changes of uh, hormonal levels. Next study that we did, and this, this is not yet published, these are preliminary results. We, uh, we used the data of the QB test that we already had um, gathered. And we asked the women doing this baseline test uh, at PsyQ and at another uh, ADHD facility, we, used, uh, we asked them additional questions on the menstrual cycle, the duration, the first, last day of the first menstruation and the use of hormones. And we excluded older women, those using hormones or having a regular cycle, or etc. We found 127 women eligible and we used their data on the QB test, uh, performance in the week one to four of the cycle. So the first week is starting at the last, first day of the menstruation and the fourth week is the last week before the next menstruation. And we did this not on an individual level, but on a group level as a cross-sectional um, study. And these are the results. We wanted to know is in the first quarter, so let's say the first, first week of the cycle on the group level, is there uh, an increased level of one of the domains of ADHD, hyperactivity, impulsivity, inattention, or the total measure, the QB total. Uh, well, what we see in a, at a glance is that the fourth quarter, so the last week before the menstruation in the young women, there was a significantly increased hyperactivity level, but not the other ones. We expect it all to be maybe more severe, but we only found hyperactivity to be significantly more uh, compared to the other first three quarters of the cycle. So what does it mean? What, what do these data tell us? Well, we know there's little research on the hormonal influences on the brain in women. The cycle has often been an exclusion criterion in research due to these changes. And there is absolutely nothing in women with ADHD. <clears throat> so I started to read the literature to find out what, what is the hypothesis behind this? How should we go on studying it? And I learned a lot from it because um, we know ADHD is associated with low dopamine levels in certain brain areas. But what I didn't know was that estrogen and pro progesterone, oh, the, the both the hormones in this, during the cycle, 
they modulate neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine, so they interact. And these sex hormones have been implicated in brain development and maintenance, so from a very young age. Those ovarian hormones directly affect the brain on cognition, memory, learning and emotion. And they influence reward-related motivation, impulsivity and temporal decision-making. These are all words that we know from ADHD uh, neuropsychological research. And estrogen influences blood flow and metabolic rate of glucose and this changes during the cycle. So these are all indications that especially estrogen is, uh, is influential on the brain and interacts with dopamine that is low in ADHD. So estrogen is in the literature regarded as a dopamine agonist. That's important to understand that we have two hormones, dopamine and estrogen, let's call them hormones, um, that, that increase our level of attention, uh, memory, control over mood, and so on. This effect of estrogen is especially in the prefrontal cortex, where we know that a lot of ADHD symptoms uh, come from. And it also affects the limbic regions, so emotional and motivational behaviors. Progesterone has a lesser role, but it, when it has a role on dopamine, it depends on previous priming by estrogen. So, this is an important paper for those interested. Estrogen shapes dopamine-dependent cognitive processes and what are the implications for women's health? This study of 2011 by Jacobs and Esposito showed um, um, that, that, um, that they, they studied it in, um, in control women and they found this interaction. So my question is, why is it more severe in ADHD? My hypothesis is that when you have two times low dopamine, that means low dopamine and low estrogen in the week before menstruation, you have no resources left for keeping up attention, memory, mood and ADHD symptoms. This could explain the increased mood instability and increased ADHD severity in this fourth week of the cycle. This was also studied in women without ADHD uh, they were, um, the relationship between hormones and ADHD symptoms was measured during the cycle and they found in normal controls higher impulsivity and inattention when estrogen was low, so in the last week before menstruation, and uh, the inattention was increased in the luteal phase, so the last weeks of the cycle. This means that stimulant response may also differ across the cycle, that's something that's never studied. Okay, what can we do about it? Well, we know from uh, research in women without ADHD, women in general, that contraceptives, four weeks long, no stop week, are effective to control uh, the, the mood symptoms and the somatic symptoms of PMDD. Same is true for SSRIs, especially for mood symptoms, so the antidepressants. Women with ADHD tell me that they temporarily also try higher doses of their for us prescribed ADHD medications, but this has never been studied and I cannot tell you whether that's a good idea or not, but they say it helps. And it makes sense when you look at, um, when you follow the hypothesis that you either have to increase estrogen using contraceptives, serotonin using SSRIs, or dopamine using ADHD medications. So it's interesting for the next study, I would say, and what, the, what we know about treatment of postpartum depression is same, SSRIs or estradiol, climacteric mood symptoms, antidepressants or estradiol or both. So it's very, um, this is, these, these treatments are proven effective in all uh, life phases of women having complaints due, due to the hormonal changes. I think we come to an end. I think it's about time. Uh, if you want to know more, this is my book where these issues are described. I give a new webinar April 6 at Karolinska Institute, 4 to 5 p.m. on sleep and health. Maybe interesting. I have previous webinars available at YouTube. And I thank you a lot for your sustained attention. It's now time for questions and I hope I still have time for answers. <laughs> thank you very much. I, I really think we have time for that. Thank you very much for that uh, lecture, Sarah, very, very interesting topic. And I see we have gotten a 
quest some questions from the clinicians. So I suggest we, we dive right into it. Right. So uh, one of the first question I've had is, um, I also see, um, I also regularly see women who have been diagnosed with a somatic symptom disorder in addition to ADHD. Is it possible that there is a relationship here too? What kind of symptom disorder? Uh, she said somatic symptom disorder. Psychosomatic symptom disorder? Mm -hmm. That's I don't know what said. it is. Okay. I, I'm not sure what somatic symptom disorder is actually. So, but it's true that women with ADHD have a lot of somatic symptoms. I could say yes. <laughs> Uh, showing the slide with all the diseases that are associated with female ADHD. And you should, in fact, look underneath the somatic presentation of tiredness and sleepiness or uh, migraines or chronic fatigue, because now you know this, that ADHD might be underneath and it's worth exploring. Mm. Sandra, so, so I have a follow-up question to that, because we get a lot of questions around uh, uh, comorbidities and do, do you think that it's because you as a as a woman you get diagnosed with another um, illness or condition first and then during that diagnostic process or as a consequence of that you are also um, you are also um, uh, checked or diagnosed with ADHD um, or do you think that it is actually over -rep uh, represented um, I think ADHD is still too often missed, especially uh, when there is a somatic illness because uh, somatic doctors and uh, people working as a GP are not aware of psychiatry in general, let alone uh, female ADHD, uh, for reasons I explained. So I think we should educate everyone, <laughs> which is quite a task, in order to uh, to. To, to identify with ADHD and help them better. Um, but for those in the audience who listen, who are interested, it's, it's important to know where to look. So you can look in, in, in psychiatric populations with mood and anxiety and sleep problems, uh, in, in clinics with postnatal depression, in clinics where perimenopausal women are coming, because you might expect an increased prevalence of ADHD there too although not yet studied, um, and uh, so on. So migraine, asthma, polycystic can ovarian syndrome, which is a hormonal disorder as well, uh, should be, should be uh, highlight you, uh, give you an idea about check. Okay, you thank you. Yeah, yeah, can hear you. Um, so, we, we have another question uh, along the same lines. So do you think that you, if you, for example, uh, um, uh, there is there reason to by default always suspect ADHD when you have too much health care for burnout chronic fatigue syndrome? I couldn't hear you completely. Is there a reason? Uh, to by default always suspect ADHD when you have female Yeah, yeah. I, I would do that in men and women, although me, women are more often burned out than men. Me, men may present with addiction or something. Uh, but when you're sleepy and tired, uh, chronic fatigue, uh, exhausted in general, perfectionistic, tired of working too hard for a long time, and especially those who have a burnout three times, who didn't learn from the first time, who repeat the difficulties over and over again. Those people should be tested immediately. Yeah. So, so it could be a good idea almost as a default to do it, or at least if it's uh, repeated. I think it should be screened for, and uh, you can use a short screener of a few items that takes no time at all. And it really could help people to improve the quality of life. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I can see uh, uh, Anna, Anna is coming back. So I'm, I, I have some additional questions and of course we still welcome uh, more questions to be uh, be added. Uh, but from the chat I have, I have some more questions. Um, um, this is, 
you know, we're moving, we, we, we've got questions around uh, comorbidities and then we've got questions around uh, the symptoms. So, so one, one question around symptom is um, if you think that hyperactivity is uh, expressed differently in female compared to male. Yeah. Or oh, whether it's uh, differently. Well, yes, um, maybe you remember in the beginning of my talk, I, I mentioned the talkativeness of women and the spontane spontaneity of women. That's that's a more positive um, uh, wording we use for behavior in women that we might not like as much in males, which when it's more a disruptive, aggressive behavior. So this is a different presentation of the same symptom called hyperactivity. But uh, yeah. on the other hand, women have uh, similar complaints like uh, a restless head, that never stops thinking and ruminating and um, uh, thinking about what to do tomorrow and never having a moment of any relaxation. Men and women have both have that. So it's it maybe it has more to do with our socialization, what we accept from men and what we don't accept from women and vice versa. That that we learn how to how to canalize hyperactivity in a in a gender appropriate way. Yeah. I believe I am yeah. back as well. So you can all see me again. I'm sorry. Mikkel, would you, did you have a question you would like to continue with? Um, yes. Yeah, so, um, so, do, so what do you believe the role is of uh, objective measures in, uh, in the diagnosis of ADHD in, uh, in, uh, in females? You mean besides uh, an interview, um, whether QB Tech, for instance, QB Test could have an additional role in women? Well, I, I think the, what we now are starting to learn is that we can objectively measure differences uh, in severity of ADHD during the cycle. This is only a start, uh, and we still have to dive into it um, further to understand what we're looking at. But I think in general, it's it's essential that clinicians are aware of these mood changes and also changes in ADC severity during the cycle, postnatally and perimenopausally, because women will feel uh, much better acknowledged and understood. And for them, it's a complete uh, mixture of, um, of uh, symptoms. Um, I have to do something about the team view or not? No. No. It's, it, is it working? Can you still hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I hope everybody can hear us, but I, I can hear you, Sandra, and you can hear me. So otherwise, the okay. two of us will have a conversation. So, yeah. So I'm not sure whether, whether we will be able to find uh, more indications of uh, changing severity of ADHD and mood during the cycle. But I, th I do think it's, it's crucial for women with ADHD that we acknowledge that these problems exist and that we are keen to help them to improve their mood using SSRIs, hormones, when, when it's possible, when it's um, allowed physically, uh, because you always have to check uh, the risks of using hormones as well. Um, but I think, I think we shouldn't um, focus on just one problem because people with ADHD have several. And, uh, so I think for women, this is especially important that we learn more about it. All right. And I have confirmation from our audience that you're heard, Sandra. So we're back on track again. Yes. Um, one of the questions that have come in is, uh, would you say insomnia and sleep disorder are consequence of mental hyperactivity? And they've written mental with um, those funny ears. Well, that's a good question that I hope to address uh, the 6th of April as well at Karolinska. Uh, but um, I do a lot of research on sleep in ADHD and insomnia is the disorder that makes it difficult to fall asleep due to rumination, hyper arousal, not being able to let go, to relax. Um, they can be a result of ADHD itself because of those hyperactive minds. But it can also be vice versa because insomnia leads to sleep loss, short sleep, shorter sleep duration, and shorter sleep is associated with ADHD symptoms, such as 
uh, lower concentration, less well-functioning memory, irritability, and um, um, binge eating, which is a result of sleep loss that we often also see in ADHD. So I, I would say there is a bidirectional relationship between sleep disorders in general, not only insomnia and ADHD, which is highly interesting because um, we are now asking not only what's chicken and egg, but also mm. are ADHD and sleep disorders, in fact, two sides of the same coin. Mm. To be continued. <laughs> <laughs> to be continued. And I've heard you talk a bit about sleep, so I know it's a very interesting interesting topic to talk about sleep and ADHD. Yeah. I see we have a lot of questions coming in. Um, so one of the questions is also, um, and please stop me if you've had this question during uh, my absence, but would Lysdexamphetamine be safe to use during pregnancy is one question. Well, um, these, the data that I showed um, say that maybe dexamphetamine, not per se list dexamphetamine, is more safe in pregnancy than mesophenidate, but these are all preliminary data. So there is not yet a guideline available that exactly can tell you what the risks are, uh, because we still are waiting for more data in larger groups of women that have used the medications during pregnancy in order to be sure. But mm. I would say follow the literature uh, in order to be uh, to have the latest information, and I showed some of the references uh, on my slide. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I also have a question here: if uh, there is evidence that fibromyalgia or chronic diseases might have correlation with ADHD in women. Yeah, I think chronicity of any disease is associated with ADHD. You know why? When you're no, chaotic, no. you're chaotic and you're um, uh, forgetful and you have difficulty taking medications and not forgetting about it. Uh, you not only forget it when you uh, use ADHD medications, but you mm. also forget it when you have to use diabetes medication, asthma medication, migraine medication, whatever treatment mm. or a diet for obesity. You are a mm. bad complier due to ADHD. Yeah as a rule. So I was invited to Davos years ago, the asthma center, uh, because they found they had so many ADHD patients among their chronic therapy resistant asthma patients. And this was not because they had a different type of asthma, we assume, but it, they had a bad compliance to the treatment that others were able to comply to. So you, you uh, ADHD induces um, uh, chronicity of every comorbidity, whether mm. it's depression, whether it's diabetes, whether it's, um, and even COVID is increased in ADHD. You know why? When mm. untreated people are not able to comply to social distancing rules or wearing masks properly. And I think and, that highlights again, the importance of, of assessing ADHD to, to find things. Yeah. yeah, because when, treat, when, when ADC was treated, uh, these numbers got down. So COVID, COVID um, associations went down when ADC was treated. This was an Israeli study from last year. So it's, mm. it's, ADC has such a, um, a huge impact on all aspects of daily life and of chronicity of any disorder. So I would say ADC is not a light disorder. Mm. Check for ADHD in any chronic patient group that you have around, and you will find them overrepresented. And you can yes, and maybe, so, and maybe, especially if they have low compliance, right? as you allude to, that that some diseases um, you might not impact the chronicity because it, it is a chronic disease. But if the compliance uh, or adherence to the medication is fluctuating or or absent, that would be uh, an interesting yeah. word, a, a trigger of the... Well, we, of we can understand that it works that way. And uh, um, they found it in this Israeli study on COVID, um, that ADHD had, had a normal risk of COVID and untreated ADHD had an increased risk, highly increased risk. So mm -hmm. I, I warn my patients about it, that they should be treated, should wear masks, keep distance. And this is all uh, mm -hmm. uh, easier when you're treated. 
But Sandra, a follow-up question on that as well. Um, since it, we know, as you spoke about earlier, that um, a lot of females might have burnout uh, symptoms or that they have chronic fatigue uh, syndromes, is there a reason to sort of by default always suspect ADHD when you have females seeking healthcare for these uh, these issues? Uh, I, I, I think that uh, chronic therapy resistant conditions should uh, alert any clinician to look uh, for ADHD. Hmm. Sure. And, and, and especially the, chronic burnout. Sorry? This, this specific question has, uh, Anna, when you, were, uh, when you were out, we had, uh, we had that specific question. So, ah. but, uh, but, it, but it's good to reiterate in a larger context. Yeah. All right. But then we'll move on to hopefully a new question. Um, so this question is about what do you think a girl or women need to avoid? Uh, would sorry, what do you think girl women would need to avoid uh, to? What do you think girl or women need to avoid regarding extra burden or of other symptoms? So sort of burnout, uh, social network. So they, if there's anything they should avoid. Um, to, to have those extra burdens. Yeah. Um, well, I think if women are aware that burnout could be the result of ADHD and sleep loss, which interferes all the time, uh, they could get treatment. So then they should avoid substance abuse and they should avoid uh, having you know, no sleep rhythm at all because this increase all sever severity of all symptoms. Um, what should they avoid at school or work? Well, I, I assume they want to finish school and that they like to have a job uh, that they aim for. And they like to have friends and that they like to be healthy. So they should not um, avoid asking for help, I would say. They should, mm. they should ask for help. And if there is no help in their environment, they should take it from the internet, such as these webinars, and they should uh, try to find someone who can help them, who is aware, and, um, and maybe even start training professionals when they are reluctant to do it by themselves. <laughs> I must say uh, our, our group of professionals is not always the eagerest one, ones to, to learn new things. I, mm. I, I'm going to admit it, but it's it's it can it's often true. So many patients are activists, and they they try to to tell us what we should look for. And I appreciate that a lot because this is the fastest way to help people better. Because mm. we we as researchers do what they really need, and um, I I think that's why it's so rewarding as well. And I mean that that's what they drive us to be curious and to learn to learn new things. So I think it's very important, yeah. as you say, to try and strive yeah. and always uh, learn and and be be better and and know more. Yeah, absolutely. So I have a question here regarding um, hormonal symptoms. So the question here is: Are there typical signs among young girls before they get their first menstruation that are similar to hormonal uh, later hormonal problems? Mm. Well, I'm, I'm afraid it has never been studied, uh, comparing girls with ADHD before menarche and after, uh, because the typical, uh, uh, the typical feature of menarche is that you have hormonal changing hormonal levels after menarche and not before. So mm. before menarche, you, you have a more equal state than after. And in, in this respect, uh, young girls differ from older girls and uh, girls differ from boys. Um, and um, I'm, I'm afraid I cannot really tell you. Um, uh, I, I assume younger girls are more stable, although they have ADHD, than mm. girls that have a menstrua menstrual cycle and hormonal mood changes, because this is what we studied and that we know for sure now. Mm. Um, but we have to find out how to better help and improve the situation and to understand why this interaction of estrogen and dopamine, of if this is really true, that this is the basis of it. Um, yeah, I don't know whether that's a good answer to the question, but... It, but it's I have an a answer. 
Please at least a follow-up. You mentioned in, during your presentation about uh, females tending to internalize uh, and males tending to externalize, and, um, and these are different uh, coping strategies as well. Could you say that that tendency to internalize goes uh, across the monarch? So you see it in in young females as well as in uh, yeah. in. Uh... Yeah, I think so. I think internalizing comorbidity in girls and women uh, is maybe independent of the hormonal changes, because these are patterns that we see across all ages in the same gender. Um, yeah. So I think that's right, that men have a, diff a slightly different presentation, more, more uh, disruptive, aggressive behavior as a, as a presentation of ADHD and other disorders, whereas girls have more internalizing shyness, um, uh, social anxiety, um, um, trying to avoid things that they are anxious about, uh, more, more withdrawn. Although we also recognize the girls that are completely hyperactive that you cannot miss in, in the room, <laughs> there they exist as well. Uh, so there's not one, one um, clinical picture for all of them, luckily. But could you, could you say that you, you might, as a young female, have your uh, coping strategy and you're actually functioning and successful, you're, or not successful, but functioning, and you, you manage and you haven't been diagnosed, and then suddenly you have to also, uh, you have to change your coping strategy because you s suddenly also have a, a hormonal cycle that, that um, mm -hmm. challenges you further. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, relate, that also relate to... Uh, to the later diagnosis of, uh, of, uh, of girls. So once they, yeah. uh, they get a cycle, they can't uh, cope on that. Yeah, you could assume that the severity of mood and ADHD symptoms increases when there is a cycle in ADHD girls. Uh, I've, I would expect that when we would study that. Uh, but we do know already that is especially a problem in menopause. So these are older women that have had ADHD all their lives without being recognized or treated that really get stuck when their mm. hormonal levels drop se severely and seriously and chronically because perimenopause has hormonal levels that go up and down, but they go down all the way. And when you're at the bottom, you really can't function. Mm. And those women are really uh, desperate and they, they should be better recognized. Uh, among the general presentation of perimenopausal symptoms. They have more severe uh, symptoms and as menopause takes 10 years, it's really something to take care of. Mm. And, and, and one just, of the... Sorry, uh, just as a note, okay. um, we also had a, uh, a question from uh, a, a, a PhD student who was actually doing a, a, her PhD at the King's College and, and um, she will also be spending some time with the Cubitech and, and she's going to study the challenges in the diagnosis and treatment of the younger females. So maybe that, mm. you know, that would That's interesting. be a bit more I light on the... On yeah, keep me updated. She was asking specifically on the chat on the, on the, on the um, micro events which is a measure you 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 get with the uh, with QB test. Um, I don't on top of my mind know that we have studied that specifically for that uh, population. But do you, have you looked at the micro events? No, not yet. No. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Something for further research, perhaps. Perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. This is just a new subject that people recognize clinically, but it hasn't really been studied or mm -hmm. let alone objective measures that have been used. Um, even hormonal levels have never been tested. Um, mm -hmm. There's a good reason for that. It's very difficult to really find differences in hormonal levels that have a broad range of normality. Uh, so you, the, the chance that you find uh, a difficult differences is uh, maybe uh, very small. But it could also be that hormonal levels are much lower in general in ADHD mm -hmm. women. It could explain other symptoms as well. So it, I think it should be done. Um, 
one day. <laughs> yeah. And I think sort of a follow-up question that comes from this, and I see that there's a few people asking this, but uh, how how do we learn to see these young girls and uh, also the the older women uh, so that they don't, you know, younger girls don't grow up before they have a diagnosis or, or older females uh, so that they get diagnosed. So what can you sort of recommend clinicians to, to be aware of when assessing women, for example? Mm. Well, I think education is essential. And without education, nobody can recognize ADHD in girls or women. Uh, so it's education, 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 education. Did I say it? Education. Uh, because without knowledge, we are nowhere to improve the lives of our patients. Mm. So joining today's webinar and also perhaps joining and seeing the, the previous webinars that you were mentioning earlier, earlier might be a, a way forward. Yes, but there are also courses in many countries where you can learn about the more basic assessment and treatment of ADHD in general. That can mm -hmm. be very useful if you're not, uh, not used to it. There are books, uh, there, there's PubMed full of research. Um, there are so many resources that you can, can use. And of course, nowadays, since Corona, we, we only make webinars. <laughs> so that's, that has a low uh, threshold for accessing new knowledge. So I, I would say use it. Yeah. Mm, definitely. Um, I saw a question. So this a question is a specific one, but uh, what are your thoughts on autoimmune diseases and ADHD? Is that something you will be able to to answer to? Did you say outgrowing? No, uh, autoimmune. Autoimmune. Okay. Well. Autoimmune disorders are increased, especially in females, one study found. And mm. um, I, I'm not sure what, what's behind that. Maybe also an interaction with hormones and immunoglobulins or um, resistance against infections. Uh, it's, it's just the first finding. So mm. uh, diseases all, such as colitis ulcerosa and uh, Crohn, Mm -hmm. the Crohn disease of the intestine, the infections, um, inflammations, uh, they are associated with women with a in women higher in women with ADHD. Mm. Thank you very much. We have a couple of questions about the uh, treatment. So, so um, what is your view on combining uh, medicine with the uh, CBT in the case of uh, comorbidities? Uh, well, we advise uh, as, a treat as a general treatment for ADHD to start with psychoeducation about ADHD and the treatment, heritability, and then uh, combine, whenever possible, medication with CBT. Um, and CBT is, is proven effective for depression and anxiety, and it works best in combination with medication for ADHD on ADHD symptoms. So we, if, whenever possible, combine the two because a patient without any focus will not profit from the best CBT in the world mm. because he can't, he can't use it properly. So that would be my advice. Yes, and I see, I agree with you, Mika. We have a lot of questions coming in on treatment. So an, an additional one is, if, um, is your is it your experience that anxiety increases when the start of treatment of methylphenidate or lisdexamphetamine? That your yeah. Experience? yeah, my experience is uh, that anxiety may increase when you start a stimulant. That's also why we also always assess uh, the anxiety disorders before we start treatment. Um, mm. And when there's really uh, hyperventilation, panic attacks, um, that people are having difficulty with to control, then we start uh, first an SSRI, not CBT, SSRI, so an antidepressant for the anxiety disorder. And after four weeks, we add the stimulant. And okay. it's, sorry? No, I was just saying, okay, confirming. Yeah, so we, we combine uh, the antidepressant treatment and we start first with the antidepressant treatment in case of anxiety in order to protect the patient against this unwanted side effect mm. because when you're anxious you're used to panic and used to increased heart rates and sweating and 
thinking you're dying of a heart attack or something, which isn't true, it's anxiety. Uh, and methylphenidate and also dexamphetamine, they do increase heart rate as a side effect. This is usually not a problem. It's usually not dangerous at all. But when you're anxious, you feel as if the panic returns. Mm. Because you recognize this, this heart rate increase and uh, this is a physical memory of panic. Uh, and you can talk about it, but it is just happening. And yeah. people who have have nothing to cope with that memory, or no, they do. They may need medication. That that does the trick. So uh, they they do have the same increased heart rate when we restart the stimulant after the SSRI, but they experience it difficult, different. They they don't um, develop the anxiety again, or to a much lesser extent. So that's that's my clinical mm -hmm. experience. It's not in, in double blind studies uh, been studied, but this is what I advise clinicians uh, on a daily basis. Mm. I I see that we have actually had a, a question on heart rate as well, but, but not uh, according uh, to anxiety. But they're asking if there are any data regarding heart rate supplementation in premenopausal pre ADHD women. I think it's hormone replacement therapy. Hormonal replacement oh, therapy, yeah. Yeah, of course, hormonal, re hormonal replacement therapy is uh, one of the hormonal therapies that are uh, prescribed for women during perimenopause that have a lot of complaints. Um, and uh, whether we, we supplement them in premenopausal women, no, I'm not aware of any study doing that. Uh, premenopausal women usually need uh, anti-conception and they they turn to uh, uh, contraceptives that are available for younger women and the levels of hormones are higher uh, in uh, contraceptives as compared to um, uh, hormonal replacement therapy for perimenopause mm -hmm. so i think it's important to have the right dose for the right age um, and to uh, but it's important also not to stop in the fourth week of the cycle with the contraceptive in order to prevent estrogen dropping again and inducing the mm. symptoms. Mm. Thank you. And thank you, Mikkel, for clarifying my misunderstanding there. But uh, I also have a question here. If, if there is any alternative, if a patient don't want medicine, we have been talking about some medication now. Mm -hmm. But just yeah. me, what's the alternative? The alternatives. Well, there's a lot of research looking for alternatives because everybody, um, well, most people don't like to having having to take medication. Uh, people are afraid of medication of side effects. So there's been a lot of research whether CBT, parent training, um, uh, psychological treatments, um, neurofeedback, fish oil, um, uh, sleeping better um, helps as well. And I can say in general that um, a lot of stuff helps, but not as well as medication. So the effect mm. is much larger using stimulant medication and there's nothing that can even be compared to it so far. Uh, as soon as it changes, we will change our, our habits and our advices because mm. we're, we're looking at efficacy and safety. Uh, and this is, uh, well, not so far for the other uh, for the other uh, alternatives. The only thing that really does something on the on ADHD is fish oil, but it also works on depression and it also works on other dis other disorders that afflict the brain. So it it helps improve brain functioning in general. It's not specific, but it has mm. a low effect size. So it's only uh, 0.3 is the effect size, whereas in stimulants is 0 0.8, 0 0.9. Yeah to give some indication and one is 100% uh, good. So <laughs> then you understand that it's a huge difference. Definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for a few additional questions. And um, one of them is, is there a, an increased risk for thrombosis or embolia when uh, contraception is used in a high dose in menopause? Um, 
well, the use of hormones and the risk of thrombosis is, is there always. And using higher dosages increase the risk. But it's difficult to predict which woman will develop thrombosis, as far as I know, unless there is a familiar history of, mm. uh, of stroke, heart attacks, cardiovascular disease. It might, might ring a bell uh, in doctors prescribing hormones. So I think prescribing hormones should be uh, the task of the GP or the, the, the internal medicine doctor or the endocrinologist, not the psychiatrist uh, as such, because they have to check all kinds of physical contraindications or risk factors that we are usually not aware of. Um, mm. and, and regarding using a high dose during menopause uh, is, is similar advice. Go to the GP and discuss uh, your personal situation with him or her and ask this question. Because if you think a high dose is better for me, my mood is better, my ADHD is better, uh, mm. you should, should discuss it first with your GP. Mm. All right, so, I think... That... I have a final question to, to, to Sandra, so, yeah. and, and thank you for, for um, being here with us today. This is specifically about the uh, Cubitec uh, and, uh, and Cubit test. So, do you have any recommendation or anything you think that we should dive into? Um, you know, you, we have also already looked at some of a lot of our data. Uh, I believe there will be some a manuscript coming out on, on a publication coming out on that, comparing large populations uh, differences between male and female test uh, yeah. individuals. But are there anything specifically around Cubit test that you would like us to to look into? Uh, in order to address this based on the data that's available uh, currently? Well, I think it would be quite interesting to to further study differences between males and females and also during the cycle. And then you need uh, maybe a larger sample that you can ask additional questions about the cycle or maybe perimenopausal women to, to, to replicate our findings in a larger group would be interesting. Um, it would it would in general be interesting to compare males and females in other maybe uh, in other ways um, uh, to just to, to circle around uh, the hypothesis and find evidence uh, because the more evidence we have the better we can follow up and study uh, treatment options for women with ADHD so I would appreciate that a lot <laughs> if you can further cooperate sure yeah. Thank you. Likewise, we Thank would you. love to uh, collaborate as well. Thank you very much. And as Michael mentioned earlier, earlier, I think that was the last question that we have time for today. So I'd like to, to say a very big thank you to both uh, Sandra and Michael for helping out during both lecture and, and the follow -up, uh, following Q&A. And to all of our viewers, I would also like to inform you that we will send a survey after today's webinar. So uh, we hope to find out what you thought about this event and also see if you have some suggestion for any future topic for webinars like this. Uh, we plan for a new webinar during spring, so uh, stay tuned for more information uh, forward. And I once again also would like to recommend the uh, webinar that Sandra is having with Karolinska Institute regarding ADHD and sleep, which I believe will, will be uh, very interesting as well. If you have any question on today's event, please feel free to email us at info at qbtech.com. And with that said, I'd once again like to thank you, uh, Mikkel and Sandra, for joining us. And also thank, uh, send a big thank you to all of you who have been watching us today. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you, my pleasure. Thank you.